Thanks for staying with us. Now, the minority in Parliament on Friday boycotted proceedings on the floor, accusing the Speaker of bias. The opposition MPs say the Speaker, Professor Michael Quay, has at times without number been disrespectful to minority members and did not hesitate to register their protest during a debate on the proposed creation of new regions. There's more in the following report. According to the minority, the speaker once again failed to acknowledge their leaders any time they rise on the floor to put their arguments across. The minority did not take kindly to failure by the speaker to allow them to speak during the debate on the proposed new regions. Before staging their walkout, the minority leader Haruna Idrisu argued that without copies of the Justice Brobe report, which formed the foundation of the proposed new regions, they cannot take part in the debate on the CI-109. The main issue I'm raising is that we can only appreciate what is in CI-109 if we do have access to the report of the Justice Brobe Commission report. Mr. Speaker, I will seldom not go into the matter as I've said again here. I know there are matters within the report that touches on sensitive issues. And we need to have a united Ghana. For instance, Savannah region, out of the northern regions. I've seen it in CI 109, page 39. If you see the composition, it's been driven by some ethnic composition. I'm raising it. I say, I've said 109. We, beyond the struggle and the strife for independence, today, today, I do not think those social uh, 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 realignment, we need to watch it and be careful. Who determines, for instance, how was the name determined, uh, Oti region? I want to know in the report. Historically, I'll be guided. If I don't see the Commission of Enquiry report, I'll have issues. The more importantly, Mr. Speaker, Northeast region out of the northern region. I come from the northern region. I know Cherpone. I know the geopolitics of northern region. Cherpone going under Mamprugo is repugnant to land ownership and its parameters between the Dabang state and Mamprugo and others and the people of Cherpone. These are matters we need to see the report in order to appreciate. He reminded the speaker that he had since last week made requests for copies of the report to be made available to the House and quoted Article 11 of the Constitution, but that has not been done. The Commission have engaged across the country, chiefs, people, opinion leaders, is travel across the country. We need to know what is in their report to guide us to contribute meaningfully to their findings in this report. When you, when you read Article 5, Article 5 lacks no, it has no flesh. It only says the president shall set up a commission of inquiry. He's done so. The commission of inquiry have made findings. I say without fear of contradiction, that the, the CI 109 is an output and a product of the Justice Brobe Commission report. It is only fair in the interest of good governance that we know what they have said. What did they find out? What are their recommendations? We cannot just give a blanket approval that because we have met minimum constitutional requirement, we should proceed. I say LI, our state law just like you. Go to Article 11. LI is based on parent act. CI is a constitutional instrument. In this matter, the constitutional instrument arises out of the Justice Brobe Commission report. We so demand lawfully that we should have it to guide this. But Minister of Regional Reorganization and Development, Dan Boche, in a counter-argument said the president had not breached any regulation by not making the Commission of Enquiry's report public since the six-month time limit has not elapsed. But I know that Mr. President has no problem at all releasing the report. But he has not broken any law. It's fully within the, what the Constitution has said. This report was presented on the 26th day of June. And obviously, 
today's date is not beyond six months. And the constitution says that within six months, Mr. President can decide to publish a report or give reasons why the report should not be published. So this is just for the uh, information of the minority leader. But the issue before us, respecting the right of speaker, is the report of the committee on the regulations contained in CI 19 submitted by the Electoral Commission. And the committee has satisfied itself that what was contained in the report is exactly what Mr. President transmitted to them at the this one. Now, President Kufuado is demanding neutrality and professionalism from the Ghana Police Service, advising the service against becoming an appendage of any political party. The president said the country is looking forward to a service that operates without fear or favor in the discharge of its mandate. He was addressing the 43 cadet officers' graduation in Accra. Currently, the police service, unfortunately, suffers lower public image than it should have. For example, the 2017 Afrobarometer report states that 92% of respondents believe that, quote, some, most, or all, unquote, police officers are involved in corruption. This can no longer be the status quo. The citizenry can only have confidence in the police service when they're seen to be honest and prepared to enforce the law without fear or favor. I am comforted by the fact that the current leadership of the police service is determined to buck the trend and you, our newly graduating class, should assist in this endeavor. It is in everybody's interest that the police service retains the neutrality and professionalism guaranteed under the Constitution. Governments have term limits, and in a multi-party democracy, parties win and lose power. It is good for the health of the nation that this is so, and this is why the police service should not tie its well-being or otherwise to the fortunes of the ruling party of the day. As President, and together with you, men and women of the police service, we must ensure that the police service is left to focus on its core mandate. I envisage a police service that goes about its duty of protecting ordinary citizens, confident that there will be no interference from the powers that be. Well, the president also announced government's plans to retool the service. We all feel safe and are able to undertake our day-to-day -day activities when we are assured of the peace and safety of our nation. We all sleep without a care in the world when we know the men and women of the police service are working to keep our communities and our streets safe. Government is cooperating with the police service and is committed to giving whatever support is required to ensure that we have the service that the people of Ghana deserve. Thus far, and in the face of some obvious challenges, we began the process of retooling and equipping the police service. Government, in December 2017, acquired some 108 vehicles for the service and in support of Operation Calm Life. And I followed this up three weeks ago when I handed over 200 Toyota vehicles for use by the police. The construction of 320 housing units to ease the problems of accommodation is ongoing. And the numerical strength of the service is being boosted by the recruitment of 4,000 men and women this year alone. You're still watching uh, Join News Prime with me, Arba Kumsin. Uh, we're taking a short break, but later in the bulletin, delegates of the opposition National Democratic Congress express mixed reactions over the delay in getting a venue 
for the 9th Delegates Congress slated for Saturday. That's tomorrow. So far, the preparation is very, very poor. I've never seen this uh, kind of preparation before. People from far place coming, coming to wait till the uh, program to end before our starting. I'll bring you details shortly after this break. You're welcome back. Now, residents and commercial drivers in Hohoi in the Volta region Friday morning embarked on a demonstration to bring to government's attention the deplorable state of road networks in the township. The demonstrators mounted roadblocks and burnt lorry ties, preventing other commercial vehicles from working in the early hours of Friday. The demonstration, according to organizers, was necessitated by the non-mention of Hohoi Township roads in the 2019 budget delivered Thursday by the Finance Minister Ken Ofuriata. There is more in the following report. It was an unusual Friday morning at Hohoe as vehicular movement in the township ceased. Vehicle tires were set ablaze as the main road leading to the central business district was blocked in protest of the deteriorating roads in Hohoe. Other commercial drivers who attempted to carry out their usual duties were denied access into the Hohoe township. The protesters lamented the poor state of the roads and expressed disappointment the Hohoe Township roads are yet to be constructed. Though government promised to invest heavily in infrastructure in the 2019 budget, not a single road in Hohoe will benefit. They expressed disappointment in the government for failing to fulfill its promise. Our politicians, they are coming here to lie for us. Today, tomorrow, today, tomorrow. See, when will they come and do this thing for us? Even Akufuado, Nana President Akufuado, come to this town. Is it last three or four months? He come here and promise us that two, within two months, the road will be get ready. They will finish the road. But up to now, we're not seeing anything. We are buying shops. We are buying boy boy Our hopes are spoiling. Our shafts are spoiling. Then the roads are not still good. See, which day will the road be done? if if you go be till eternity self unless the road is done before we go start the work because our eye red if you only fit test the electricians where they chop our money every day increment of fuel we day here with the cry every day but they know they do anything with the change government every day for good for better ghana but still we know they see anything they want to go do again it means they go fishing for a bit make we kill each other before you see so we, our eye red that be what we get so today action the camp starts this one i lost i'll be freestyle we know they see police we know they see teacher we know they see anybody we the drivers today we the camp show the country so which we did ghana Well, Andrew Steady Ofori is the Municipal Chief Executive for Hohoi, and he joins me on the line live. Good evening, and thanks for your time, Mr. Ofori. Good, good evening, and good evening to your listeners. Now, you may have heard um, the people in Hohoi, the residents of Hohoi, they're complaining about the dilapidated nature of the road. They say they have brought this to the attention of the local authorities uh, for several years and nothing is being done about it. Has this come to your attention and what are you doing about it? Yes, this is a, a major problem in the municipality uh, for so many years uh, now. Uh, you, if you can recall, uh, during the 2016 campaign, it was even said by the uh, former President Mahama that the road had been constructed. So until recently, when the president, Nana Kupado, came on his tour to ascertain the fact, that it came to light that uh, it wasn't true. So the president promised the people uh, in a rally, or at a rally, of chiefs and elders, and uh, the people in Hohoe, that he was going to fix the road. He came with the minister for roads. And true to his word, the, uh, the vice president also followed up just this Sunday, last week. And uh, he assured the gathering, or uh, the people of Hokwe, that the uh, uh, government has taken serious note of it and uh, it's been put uh, in the budget. 
uh, that was read yesterday. And true to his words, it was uh, announced in the budget that uh, uh, from Kwevi uh, 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 to Kokwe, and then even inner city rules of Kokwe, mentioned it in, the, in the budget. So for the people, after hearing this budget, uh, coming onto the street this morning to demonstrate is something which is uh, actually disturbing and uncalled for. So what assurances have you been making to them that this road will indeed be uh, fixed, uh, if you like, because their complaint is that they didn't hear it in the budget. So it is what... in the budget. It is in the budget. But if you heard some of the demonstrators, what they are saying is that they will continue to embark it, it, on these it, it, it protests not, until the not, road is fixed. It means they did not listen to the uh, Minister for uh, Finance. What I'm it asking is you budget. is what assurances are you giving them? Because let's yes. assume that they haven't heard it in the budget. What assurances are you giving them that these roads will be fixed? Our government does not want to continue doing things abundantly as it happened in the, in the past. That, uh, because everything has to be budgeted for. So if now that the government has budgeted for it, it means funds will be made available for the, the, the road to be uh, constructed. And that is a very good in, in assurance enough. That is why I'm saying the demonstration was uncalled for this morning. Do we know... More especially when the police... Uh, uh, indicated that uh, the, the, today was not very good for that, such a demonstration because they could not provide a, a, a security for them. Is there any indication when uh, the construction or the reconstruction of the road will begin? Well, like I said, it, uh, once it has been uh, mentioned in the budget, it means funds are being allocated for it. And that will actually... Uh, 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 that to determine uh, when work will continue or will, will start again. All right. Many thanks for your time. So that is Andrew Steady Ofori. He is the Municipal Chief Executive for Hohoi uh, speaking to us there. You're still watching Join News Prime. You're welcome back. Now, the Kumasi Amyang Kwanta Obuasi Road is one of the many projects outlined in the 2019 budget by Finance Minister Ken Ofuriata in Parliament Thursday. It comes as efforts are underway to revive the Obuasi mine, which has remained closed for the past three years. For a distance that averagely takes 45 minutes to cover, motorists now have to spend four hours on that same stretch. Like many roads over the years, this is not the first time it has featured in the national budget without execution. Prince Apia has some driving experience on the stretch to share in the following report. <laughs> Passengers in this commercial bus had anticipated to reach Bogoso in the western region from Kumase at most in five hours. Midway through the journey, however, we meet the driver, Eric Edu, lying under his vehicle, trying to fix a broken part. The vehicle has been stationary for close to 30 minutes. Spring. Spring. Spring in Ebu. Oh, this car come with the man, 3.2. Is that 3.2? Me do one more, one more, the two million. I'm the two dozen. Say the way I'm going to manage it, I'm back. I can't manage the message. I'm so Is that another man? The two is that scans on us. Papa. Is that spring is so good? I'm making 2.5. Is that my day? Edu runs to a nearby mechanic shop for help to get his vehicle continue the journey. Just after 10 minutes of setting off from the spot, the vehicle breaks down again. <laughs> so we meet this vehicle for the second time on the Kumase Takwa route. Now, a journey that's supposed to last for four hours has taken more than seven hours. And these passengers and the driver have had to wait and wait and wait to get the vehicle fixed again. 
Now the driver have gone out to bring some mechanics to try and fix the vehicle for the second time. Whether it will be able to continue the journey, we we'll wait to see. Hopelessness, frustration and anger are written all over the faces of these passengers. The road is very bad. Our leaders don't think about us. Why? Why must I spend almost three days on this commercial to talk about it? God will punish them if they don't fix the road. Because of the nature of the road, you have to move with high gear. So we burn a lot of fuel. Due to the terrible nature of the road, this gentleman has resorted to patching sections of it in what is known as one man contractor initiative. He makes a few cities from tips for motorists and even commuters for his reward. The alternative for users of the road is to go through Bekwai at Dansia Sokwa from Amyankwanta for averagely two and a half hours to reach Obwase. Some transport owners, however, are threatening to stop their vehicles from plying the roads. We will withdraw our buses from the Dunkwa Obwasi through Takwa Corridor. The nature of the road is seriously bad. The road affects our buses, therefore it's a bad business for us to remain plying on that stretch if government doesn't fix the road. Another budget has captured this road to the Golden City for rehabilitation. Residents and road users can celebrate only when, as one respondent put it, they see construction equipment on site. Prince Apia, reporting. You're still watching Join News Prime with me, Arba Kumsen. Now, still ahead, we have that exclusive with the uh, former UBS uh, trader, Kweku Adoboli, uh, coming up. Uh, he spoke to my colleague Israel Lai. We'll be bringing you that interview shortly. That's an exclusive. But right now, though, uh, some social development experts have criticized government's move to make the tax identification number a precondition to access some social services like health and education. You will recall that uh, in his presentation of the 2019 budget to Parliament yesterday, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata pointed out that access to free health care, acquisition of a driver's license, for example, will all require individuals have a TIN. Well, guess what? Even beneficiaries of the free SHS program will also require the TIN. And so Oforiata explains why government decided on this course of action. Government will broaden the tax net by simplifying payment of taxes through different routes under the guidance of GRA, including the elimination of paying for government services or cash, requiring that citizens show they attend before accessing social services like free health care, free secondary school education, and beginning in September of this year. Other services like vehicle license and registration, passport services, money services, as well as mobile money services, giving all persons and entities, regardless of resident status, an opportunity to honor their moral tax obligations that justify their access to public goods. We will further accompany these with some reliefs in 2019. Well, this decision has attracted mixed reactions from Ghanaians. While some have welcomed the move, others believe it will create challenges. But me, I think um, since we are yet to go to 2019, maybe we just wait and see how it's going to come out. Is it feasible? That's a question we have to be asking. Uh, I'm interested in the 2.5 billion US dollars for the industry here in Ghana. Um, I mean, we are looking for jobs and know that so if there's an amount like this for just industry here in the country i'm just being hopeful that it works out correctly i i didn't watch the whole three and a half hours i guess uh, but i was able to chance upon a few things i'm excited that an amount of money has been allocated to the office of the special prosecutor it is one of the major uh, finance 
has been one of the major challenges of that office. And hopefully, uh, with the allocation of this. Okay, so I think it's a good decision because I think it's a good decision because um, so far it's going to help even with the national education card so it makes people like we don't get fake people doing the national IDs and all that and so I think it's a good idea yeah well some experts have raised concerns about the practicality of implementing this new decision so how will it be ruled out to ensure the vulnerable are not left out in the provision of crucial social services a deputy finance minister Kweku Kwating has been explaining this to my colleague, Philip Namfuri. TIN has always been an important requirement uh, uh, as a citizen or a business entity with, within Ghana. The enforcement has been weak. We changed the law. We put it in the Revenue Administration Act. And if you look at the act, it lists several services uh, and transactions that you cannot do without TIN as an individual. But somehow compliance was never ensured. What we are saying is that now compliance uh, of those uh, laws will have to, I mean, law provisions, uh, legal provisions will be uh, ensured. So that is the first point. It is as to when the implementation uh, will start, I say yesterday. I say yesterday, uh, those that are already in law will be enforced immediately. Uh, those that are not will be sending like a, a, a bills to parliament to be legislated and then and that will be in respect of the social services but if you look at the law it does not appear to be very clear on the social services on the others dealing business with the bank uh, accessing the services of the police and a lot of the other things uh, the law is very clear but on social services you see the ministries, uh, 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 local governments are there. That if you wanted to do business with them, you must have a thing. But the law does not clearly say that uh, in respect of the delivery of social services, it is only uh, ten holders who can benefit. So we we would send legislation to fill that gap. So let that information go. That the implementation or the the, the intensified enforcement of the provisions relating to tax identification number has started. So you heard Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Kwating there. Let's do some analysis on this. We're joined on the line by uh, Executive Director of Child Rights International, Bright Appear. Good evening and thanks for your time, Mr. Appear. Yeah, good evening. So you're not entirely happy that the tax identification number is going to be made a precondition to access the some social services. Government says that this is one of the ways that it is adopting to capture as many taxpayers as it can. So what's wrong with that? Well, there is nothing wrong with it if the intention of government is supporting the tax base. And for that matter, I didn't want to know the number of people who can pay tax or who find themselves in a vulnerable position. Uh, so that if for the purposes of tax, we don't have issues with it. But where I see an issue has to do with the fact that you tie in the enjoyment of social services for the vulnerable people in respect to the, the obtaining uh, such uh, a number before they can enjoy it. That is where the issue is. And I'm raising this because uh, if you look at uh, the social investment hello mr appear if you can hear me uh, you were talking about the issues you had with the implementation of this particular decision yes i can i can hear you and what what i'm saying is that what we have with it has to do with the fact that you tie in the you tie that the agreement of social services for the vulnerable right. that we are saying this because if you look at the the weird manner we have implemented our social uh, uh investment programs in this country and it's not uniform as you think and it's also not tied to the kind of the graduation that we have in terms of getting people 
who, by virtue of uh, uh, the work that they do, they will be all 30 programs of, of, of this country. Because most of the intervention programs that we have in this country, about 80% of them target people who are below the age of 18 years. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you are dealing with a constituency where, by law, they are limited in terms of having access to some of these things that we are talking about. So there should be some consistency in explaining the purpose of which government wants to introduce the the, the, the the TIN number. If it is for, for increasing the, ta the tax base, that is understandable. But it would be very difficult for, for me to come to some understanding in terms of how government wants to that and tie it to the instrument of social services. I think we will need more explanation mm. uh, uh, to that. But Definitely, we, we would need to yeah. you know, get a further explanation on this uh, from government. But your work focuses on children. So let's talk about the free SHS, which is also a social intervention, which the finance minister says beneficiaries must have a tin to access. So those who are advocating for it argue that this is the best time to capture their details before they go out into the world of work. You disagree? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know how visible that is. Because, one, if you look at the, the free SHS, it's, it's a policy that we are implementing. And it's a wholesale policy that we are implementing. Therefore, everybody, irrespective of whether you have a team number or not, you're supposed to enjoy that policy, based from government's own assessment in terms of what uh, government wants to do. So on the basis of that, uh, it is good for people to have TIN numbers, but enjoyment of that will not have anything to do with the TIN number unless government is changing its position that I'm targeting a group of people that are going to benefit from some, po uh, some of these policies. But where policy is on a wholesale, irrespective of uh, whether you have the TIN number or not, you can enjoy it. And if government is worried about database, of course, this is the first time that we have implemented a program and then we have what happens within the system, and that database is with the Ministry of Education. So clearly, there are modalities that you can obtain database. But if government is tying that to, you know, to, to people obtaining uh, a TIN number, it, it, it there's some inconsistency in terms of what government wants. Do you want that? Do you want it because you want to know the income level of people? Do you want it because you want to increase would the you tax say, base? Would you say government should pull this policy, they shouldn't go ahead with this implementation? Yeah, of course, because we would need, we would need more explanation to it, because it doesn't, it doesn't speak to the fundamental principles of implementing that particular policy, especially the free SHS. Mm -hmm. You know, if you talk about, for instance, if you talk about the LIB, the LIB is, is a targeting program, it's a targeting mechanism. And, and the, one of the things that you want to do with the LIB is that to graduate people, take people out of the poverty line, and then if they are okay, then you stabilize them in the system. But if you are speaking to some of these policies that you want them to do that in order to monitor their, their progress level, that is understandable. But it's not a program where yourself you know that is a wholesale policy and you still think that you'd want to tie some of this intervention to it. And if it's about database, then I, that just as I've mentioned, Ministry of Education will be able to provide a database for, for that program. So uh, government come clear on what exactly it means by saying that uh, the enjoyment of the free SHS, henceforth, would hang on the identification numbers and all that. What, what is the purpose? And, and we will need explanation in all that. All right. Many thanks for your thoughts on this matter. That is uh, Bright Apia. He is the Executive Director of Child Rights International. Now, delegates of the Opposition National Democratic Congress have expressed mixed reactions over the delay in getting the venue ready for the ninth Delegates Conference slated for Saturday. Although some disagree the delay will not have any effect on the elections, others fear this may impact on the Congress. They cited a church rally currently ongoing at the Fantasy Dome as one of the unexpected hitches, and they say their leaders should have been proactive in selecting a venue suitable for the election of national executives for the party. Emmanuel Jivanu was there and now reports. This is the Trade Fair Center in Accra, where the largest opposition party in Ghana, I'm talking about the National Democratic Congress, will be having their ninth national delegate conference to elect a national executive to lead the party uh, going to the 2020.
city elections. Uh, you enter into the trade fair center, one is greeted with a lot of uh, banners of the various candidates, over 60 candidates we are told who will be vying for various positions in the party, selling their message to the over 9,000 delegates who will be converging at this centre to elect national executive for the party going into the 2020 elections. Uh, this is where the Congress will be happening, but as you can see, the sounds coming from the auditorium isn't uh, from the preparations for uh, the delegate conference, but it's coming from the redeemed Christian church who are having their time with Christ over here, meaning that preparations for the national or the elections might delay for some time. So far, the preparation is very, very poor. I've, I've never seen this uh, kind of preparation before. People from far place coming, coming to wait till the uh, program to end before our starting. Look at the number of delegates that are coming to vote and then things. So I don't think it's helping or it will help. This is not a surprise to us because we had already had arrangement with management. The program officially will end at 10. So from 10, we have an interim team that will make sure that the, the place is really dressed up for program tomorrow. Yeah. We were able to find out, and the information that we get was that uh, it had been rented for uh, a church program, and the church will complete their program this night. It means that tomorrow is free for our program. It's not much concern because, uh, I mean, arranging things and designing the place wouldn't take that much long. Uh, for fears, no, because the church program will finish this dawn at 12 midnight. Um, you know, it's a, a week, uh, what do you call it? Um, a church, I mean, it, it was a week long program that they were having and it will come to an end today. I mean, you know, the venue, is open for the public and that in that case they rented the place before us so definitely we can't do anything now the biggest news this week is the budget to give you quick highlights the total revenue and grants for the 2019 fiscal year is 58.9 billion CDs. Out of this money, the Special Prosecutor's Office will receive 180 million CDs to fight corruption. In case you don't know, uh, you need tax identification number, the TIN, to access social services. Government will broaden the tax net by simplifying payment of taxes through different routes under the guidance of GRA, including the elimination of paying for government services or cash, requiring that citizens show their attend before accessing social services like free health care, free secondary school education, and beginning in September of this year. Other services like vehicle licensing and registration, passport services, banking services, as well as mobile money services. Given all persons and entities, regardless of resident status an opportunity to honor their moral tax obligations that justify their access to public goods. This is indeed a laudable idea. We need to widen the tax net, pay our taxes to help government pull resources together and build our beloved country. But there are concerns. What plans have been put in place to ensure that the less educated understand the essence of the tin? For example, if I live in Inzulenzu where I should go register for TIN, and how long will it take for me to get the number? Government should also run an educational campaign to make the process smoother because it would be unfortunate to hear that an old lady in Nyamibetre who has no formal education has been denied social services because she, does, she doesn't have a TIN. Well, government has stated that it would support churches to build a national cathedral by providing prime land. Mr. Speaker, the state is facilitating this process by providing the land, the secretariat, and some seed money for the preparatory phase. Mr. Speaker, 
The president is determined that the building of the National Cathedral would not put a new financial burden on the state. Well, earlier, church leaders said no state funds will be used to support the building of the cathedral. As the president mentioned, the state will not build a cathedral. Rather, Christians and other interested persons are raising the funding. Look at what the Church of Pentecost alone has built in Gumafete. It means if we come together as Christians, we can't build this cathedral. So now that the state is supporting with seed money, it's only fair to know how much the state is pumping into the project. How big is the seed? Is it as small as a mustard or as big as a coconut seed? Inquiring minds want to know. Transparency is key in the governance business, so government must let us know.